Hey guys, welcome to the second video of the Word Origin series. I was actually planning on saving the next Word Origin video for a little down the track, but I noticed that the article on the Real History website that covers the topic of this particular video has been getting significantly more traffic recently, likely as a result of the media covering the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, describing some anti-coronavirus policies as draconian. Since it's clear that a lot of people are wondering what draconian means and where the word came from, I figured I should make sure I have both an article and a video covering the topic. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's get to it. First things first. What does draconian actually mean in today's world? Well, the Oxford English Dictionary defines draconian as laws themselves or their application being excessively harsh or severe. Now I'm sure that there are more than a few of you who thought the word must be somehow related to dragons. There's no point denying it, you can't hide from me. Unfortunately for everyone, there are no dragons in this story. There is, however, an ancient Greek man by the name of Draco, whose name in Greek means dragon, so there is that. Anyway, Draco hailed from the city-state of Athens, the birthplace of democracy. He was what is sometimes referred to as a lawgiver, that is, someone who is responsible for establishing substantial civic laws or reforms. Other notable Greek lawgivers include his contemporary Solon of Athens and the semi-legendary Lycurgus of Sparta the man supposedly responsible for establishing the famously militaristic Spartan social system. Very little is known about Draco's life. We don't know when he was born, or who his family were, or even what he did for the majority of his life. What is known is that Draco was the first recorded legislator in Athenian history, and we know he was the first recorded legislator because it was Draco who laid down the very first written legal constitution of Athens. Indeed, Draco first appears on the historic record in 622 or 621 BCE, when he established the legal code that is referred to by historians as the Draconian Constitution. This revolutionary legal code transitioned the Athenian judicial system away from oral laws and the practice of blood feuds to a codified system of laws that were enforceable solely by a court of law. So how then does someone who transformed the Athenian legal system become associated in modern English with laws that are excessively harsh or severe? Well, the term draconian in the sense that we now use it is derived from the fact that Draco's laws were actually notable for their incredible harshness. The death penalty was used liberally, even for the most minor offences, such as stealing a piece of fruit or a loaf of bread. According to some historians, Athenians later claimed that the death penalty was the only punishment for those who broke Draco's laws. The ancient historian Plutarch, who it must be said was writing almost 700 years after the event, describes an encounter during which Draco explained the reason for his preference for capital punishment. And Draco himself, they say, being asked why he made the death penalty for most offences, replied that in his opinion, the lesser ones deserved it, and for the greater ones, no heavier penalty had yet been found. Draco's reforms are also notable for its explicit sanctioning of the practice known as debt slavery, whereby an unpaid debt owed to a member of a higher social class would be resolved via the enslavement of the debtor. This practice inevitably resulted in a consolidation of wealth in the upper classes. However, despite its historic reputation for harshness, the Draconian constitution was notable for one reform that is still an integral part of modern legal systems right down to the present day, 2,600 years later. Draco is the first known lawgiver to make a distinction between murder and involuntary homicide, with the difference being the innovative legal concept of intent. 
This so-called homicide law has its legacy in many modern legal systems as the distinct crimes of murder and manslaughter, with the former generally requiring what is known as malice aforethought, or the clear intention to kill. Perhaps Draco's most enduring influence on Athenian democracy came in the form of the Council of 400, also known as the Bull, which was established in the Draconian constitution, but is often incorrectly attributed to Solon of Athens. This council, chosen by lot, was responsible for setting the legislative agenda of the assembly, or ecclesia, of all Athenian citizens. By the 5th century BCE, the golden age of Athens, the bull was the predominant governmental body in Athenian democracy. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the incredible harshness of Draco's laws led to intense discontent and unrest within Athenian society. In fact, aside from those that established the basic structure of the legal system, every single draconian law was repealed by the next great Athenian lawgiver, Solon, in 594 BCE with the notable exception of the Homicide Law. As for Draco himself, as far as historians and classicists can tell, at some point his fellow Athenians drove him into exile. He took refuge on the nearby island of Agena, where he apparently remained until his death at an unknown date. So there you have it. The word Draconian has nothing to do with dragons, which was a great disappointment to me, and everything to do with a man who apparently thought execution was an appropriate punishment for stealing a cabbage. No wonder they gave him the boot. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I did making it. If you are enjoying the Word Origin series, I've got plenty more to come, so make sure you subscribe to the Real History channel and turn on notifications. Also, tell all your friends. Or if this video has gotten your etymological juices flowing and you just can't wait, head over to the Real History website where you can find more Word Origin articles. The link is in the description. As always, I would like to thank my patrons for their ongoing support. If you would also like to support Real History, you can do so by heading over to the Real History Patreon page via the link in the description. Finally, you can follow Real History for updates and shorter history posts on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. The links to all these pages are, surprise surprise, in the description. Once again, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.